With your with the tour you're doing, Neil, mm-hmm. um, can we just talk about that? I mean, what what what, what are people going to get from it? Sure. Well, I mean, it's a, it was a book that I've been thinking about writing for quite a while. Okay. Uh, basically, because the the kind of um, television career I've had, I suppose, over the last you know nearly twenty years, yeah, I've been round and round Britain. I've mm. been all around the coast, many times, and I've been crisscrossed the interior, and it, it had occurred to me that I had seen so many places, a lot of them unfamiliar to most people, yeah. and uh, it, it seemed to me that there was a, there was a story to be told, okay. uh, that each, each one of them, if I picked the right hundred, uh, yeah. there was a kind of a, a grand narrative of Britain. Okay. And part of the fun of it is that for me, it, it's always mattered a great deal to me to be able to sort of go and physically stand in places where history actually happened. Mm. You know, battlefields and graveyards and uh, grand buildings and, you know, places where events actually unfolded. And mm. apart from anything else, each of these hundred is somewhere that someone can go. And if they're kind of wired up the same way I am, mm. I think there's a bit of a thrill to be in certain places, knowing that 50 years or 500 years or 1,000 years previously, yeah. something happened there. Um, so I, I, I wrote the book, mm. and uh, it, it also seems to me it was a... Uh, it might be quite a good idea to take it around the country. Yeah. Um, I'm doing 39 venues. Yeah, yeah. Um, there'll probably be, I don't know if, they, if the tickets sell, there'll be between sort of 500 and maybe 1,000 people in each. Mm. So it'll give me live contact with, you know, a good few thousand people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's quite different than doing television. You know, I, yeah. when, you're on te- when I do television, I'm, I'm basically... With a, with a director, a cameraman, and a sound man. It's quite an intimate yeah. little encounter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but with a live audience, which I've done, you know, I've, I've publicised books in the past, although mm. not on this scale, uh, and it's very revealing, I suppose. You get instant feedback mm. about whether or not you're making sense, yeah. <laughs> whether, people, whether or not people get the point you're trying to make. Yeah. You see it right there in front of you, and it's worth doing. So mm. I, I just thought I would throw myself into it and, uh, and do a sort of small to medium-sized mm. National tour. I mean, will it be a more like location specific? Like, say, on each tour you do, at each location, will you be aiming to bring up more of the local? I'll, I'll be depending on where I am. Mm. You know, if, yeah. if the venue happens to be, you know, within reasonable reach of of one or more of the places in the book, then mm. then I would, you know, probably talk about those places that night. Mm. Um, but there's a. It's not the book isn't a. It, the book's not a guidebook. You know, okay. it's not really a. It's not a guided tour of Britain. It's more. The point of the book is more to to give people a sense of how much has happened here. Yeah, yeah. My, my feeling at the moment, I mean, I get it myself from, from watching the news and reading the papers, and there was a lot of anxiety around in, in Britain and in the world. Yeah. People are worried about all sorts of things, mm. politics, Brexit, mm. Trump, uh, global warming, plastic in the oceans, yeah. Vladimir Putin, you know, poisons, another chalk in Salisbury. You know, there's an awful lot of stressful news around and yeah. I think if you don't have history you can tend it can be easy to think that things are, are worse now than they've ever been yeah. or that we're living in a particularly I don't know dangerous moment in history yeah. and I think there's a great deal of reassurance to be taken from looking back at a million years of British history and knowing that much more than that has happened here already so and we've somehow come through it all yeah. uh, you know we've had our wars of religion, mm. we've had our civil wars, you know, we've been invaded, you mm. know, we came under threat of, you know, of, uh, of, you know, dictators bent on world domination yeah. twice in the 20th century. Yeah. You know, there's always been stuff around and Britain has always been here mm. and our ancestors have coped with and adapted to and overcome everything that's been thrown at them. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a simple reassurance. I mean, that's part of the value of, of history. Mm is knowing that, you know, we're not alone in time. You know, our parents, our grandparents, they've all come through events of one sort or another. Uh, and I, I happen to think that uh, it's it's very instructive mm. to be given places that you can go to and just take in the, take in the atmosphere of the place. Yeah. Be it a grand building mm. or a cliff top or a mm. lighthouse or a castle or a battlefield. You can go in these places. Some of them seem to be imbued with an atmosphere born of the events that unfolded there. And I just think it's fun, apart from anything else. But also, it can bring people 
back to normality anyway. Because obviously when you look at the news, if you talk about something like that, it's all propaganda, isn't it? And it's all fear, yeah, fear, it's, fear, it's, fear. It's very, it's very easy to feel... We're, we're, we've got access to so much information at the moment. Totally. Unfiltered, yeah. really. Um, it's coming at us out of everything. Mm. You know, your fridge practically tells you the news now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, it, and it's not... Um, you know, it's not distilled and edited in the way that it was even when I was a cub reporter. I mean, mm. you know, when I worked in newspapers, when I started out in newspapers, yeah. you know, 20 years ago, it was even different then. Okay. And so people are, are are being swamped by a kind of tsunami of data mm. about everything. Mm. And I think everyone's heads are kind of ringing with it. Yeah. And there's like, there's, there's some therapeutic value to be had from, I think history allows you to get some distance. Mm. It lets you it lets you sort of draw back from what's happening in August 2018, mm. and see it see those events in the context of a much bigger picture. Mm. You know, and if you go back 20 years or 50 years, something big was happening, and and it passes. Yeah, I and mean, people know, got through we, it, and we got through it, didn't we? People got through it. Yeah, and we're, we're being deluged at the moment. You know, you hear so much about everything. Mm. You previously, you would just have turned on the news at nine o'clock, and you would have got one version of of something that an American president had said, or yeah. or an incident somewhere. But as it stands at the moment, you get infinite amounts, <laughs> infinite amounts of information about everything that happens yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. People are for it. People are against it. You know, people that think they understand it, it's constant. Mm. Uh, and for me, I, 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 I partly wrote the book, mm. it, it, not as therapy, but it, I, got, I got a lot out of reminding myself about how much has happened here. It, it sounds like a funny thing to say, but Britain's a very old country. Yeah, of course. My yeah. story starts a million years ago with yeah. some footprints made in the mud on mm. a beach in Norfolk by, you know, by ancestors of a, of a, of a different species of ours, yeah. Homo antecessor. Yeah. And by and large, these islands have been inhabited ever since, mm. ice ages notwithstanding. There's been people here, and one thing after another has happened. Mm. And, you know, and then you look at what's happening this year and you think, well... No, I agree. Um, it, it's. It, I think the, the, with the book, I mean, obviously, with the tour, you, you're going to bring a lot of people's anxieties down, you know, by opening them out, their eyes and okay. it, to it's the. Just, it's, it's, you get too. You can get too focused on the present. Mm. You can get, yeah. you get too tied up yeah. in what's happening right this minute. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of you know, there's a lot of valid comment about being in the moment and, and, and paying attention to what's happening right now, but yeah. conversely it can also be too much, mm. and I think you can draw a breath and pull back and think about what happened in, in such and such a place 50 mm. years ago, 100 mm. years ago, 1,000 years ago, mm. and you get the sense of the longer arc of history mm. of which we're a part, you know, I mean we're all, we're all survivors, everyone, everyone that's alive today in Britain or anywhere else in the world, you know, we're all remarkable survivals, we're connected you know, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, back through a line of people that goes back a hundred thousand years. Mm. It's an extraordinary story, really. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's worth, the best, yeah. it's, worth, it's worth paying. It's just worth paying attention to. I mean, I was my interest in history stemmed from childhood when I when I realised that both of my grandfathers had survived the First World War. Okay. Yeah. Albeit both of them had, had been injured. Yeah. You know, my my dad's dad was still alive when I was a little boy, and he had scars visible scars on his body Jeez. from the First World War so that when I did the First World War at, at school mm. it, it, rather than it being something that had happened to millions of other people 70 years ago mm. I knew that it related to my family Yeah, yeah. because both of my grandfathers had been hurt by it and I used to think God, if they'd been hurt slightly worse mm. I wouldn't be here at all mm. Yeah, true, you know, because true. You know, if, my, if either of my grandfathers hadn't made it you know, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation now. And, yeah, yeah. and so I, I felt, so from, from very early on, I realised that history wasn't something that was uh, separate from me. Mm. It was part of, everything was part of my family's story. Mm. Everything had played into, you know, the fact that the people that built, um, you know, Neolithic monuments at Stone, at, at the Ness of Broadbury in Orkney, which is one of the sites that's in the, the list of 100 places, mm -hmm. I had, I must have had, as you did, uh, ancestors who were Neolithic farmers. Yeah, yeah. And I find that amazing. You know, I was, you know, my my genes 
go all the way back to there and beyond. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, way, the, thread of, the, the thread that comes down to me has yeah. come through, you know, the hunter-gatherers at the end of the Ice Age, through the Neolithic, through the first metal workers, yeah. you know, through the conquest by the Romans. It comes all the way down, and I am somehow a survivor of all of that history. No, exactly. By if chance. Just, yeah, if you just take something that happened, say, a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago, that we, we, won't, we wouldn't be here. Like you say, it's yeah. like, I, mean, I can tell you one little thing about my great grandfather. He was in World War One, and he was covered in lice. He poured paraffin over himself, set himself on fire just to get rid of all the lice because he was so co- going crazy. He survived, and obviously I'm here talking to you. Sorry, uh-huh. <laughs> it's a diff- yes. Sorry, it just it just it just reminded me of something. You know, no, that's right. <laughs> that, I, so I I find there's something incredibly um, satisfying about knowing that I'm connected to all our history. I mm. must be. Mm. You know, I must have had people who were around when there were Romans in Britain. Yeah, yeah. You know, I must have had people who were around when, you know, when the wars of religion were going on. Mm. You know, somehow or other, my ancestors survived that, mm. you know, and had their children and their children had their children and eventually it comes all the way down to me. And I, I, I find that amazing. And, and part of the, I suppose one of the, the points of the book really is this, is this idea that there are places, there are places that you can go to rather than just reading about these events. Mm. Mm. There are places you can go to and feel, or I do, physically close to the events. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the battles that I talk about is Flodden, which was fought between England and Scotland in 1513, and mm. uh, James the Fourth, the King of Scots, died in the battle along with scores of the mm. great and the good of the land. It was a massive disaster for uh, for the Scottish nation. Mm. Um, and you can go to the battlefield of Flodden. It's up in uh, Northumberland, mm. and it's a beautiful sweep of of gently rolling countryside. Uh, and, and to me, there's, as well as being fascinated by reading the story of Flodden, that you can go and, and be on those fields where those men fought and died, including yeah. a king. Yeah, yeah. That just, that just amazes me. Yeah, yeah. And likewise, you know, I talk about uh, the tomb of Margaret Beaufort, who, mm. who's in Westminster Abbey. Mm. You know, she was the mother of Henry VII. Now, he was the ultimate victor of the Wars of the Roses. Okay, yeah. He, he yeah. was the father of Henry VIII. Yeah. But you can go and stand beside the box in which are the bones of Margaret Beaufort, who was the mother of all of that. Yeah, And yeah, to yeah. me, there's, it's just me. Or, or there are, I know there are other people like me, but I find that spine-tingling yeah, to go true. and be somewhere where that happened. You can go to the island of Iona, yeah. off the west of coast of Mull, which yeah. is one of the islands off the west coast of Scotland, and there's a patch of rock where we know from, from excavations and radiocarbon dates that yeah. St. Columba, whoever yeah. he was, yeah. built himself a little wooden cell and spent time in it, reading, writing, okay. contemplating eternity. Jesus. And you can, if you want, you can go and touch the rock that Jesus. you must have touched. And I, that I fascinates get a, me. I get a, yeah, it fascinates I me. I get a kick from, I get a kick from that. Uh, and I think, so as, as an individual, you know, if you're this book, if you wanted to, you can go to, you can go to these hundred places and put yourself physically close to the event. Do you remember the, the game, uh, the handshake game, you know, where you, you know, if, I had, if I'd shaken hands with Tony Blair, yeah, yeah, you yeah. shook hands with me, you yeah. get Tony Blair in two. Yeah, yeah. You know that game? Yeah. Well, you know, I have, I, during the course of things, I mean, I excavated, I was part of a, a team that found the, the pelvis of Alfred the Great. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, I have, I have held Alfred the Great's arse bone in my hand. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Fucking hell, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's meaningless. Maybe that doesn't actually mean anything at all no. in any scientific sense. But, but it seems incredible to me that I have physically touched the physical yeah. mortal remains of the man remembered by history as, as the founder of England. Jesus. You know, I've physically touched him. <laughs> and, he's <laughs> yeah. been, and he's been dead and gone. He's been dead and gone for a thousand years. Jesus. So... Jesus. That, the book hopefully encapsulates some of that yeah. excitement that I feel about the fact that no matter how long ago it happened, those footprints in the mud at Haze, but it's a million years old, mm. a mil- best part of a million years ago, mm. and all they ever were were muddy footprints. They were, they, were, they were only preserved by being covered over by other mud and then buried mm. for a long, long time, and then eventually the sea eroded again, and archaeologists caught a glimpse of these footprints before they disappeared forever. Mm. But nonetheless... You know, muddy footprints made by people who are not even Homo sapiens. Yeah. Another version of humankind. Jeez, yeah. They walked across a beach the best part of a million years ago, mm. and those archaeologists, a million years later, were able to come in physical contact with where those feet had been. That blows my mind. It's it's just fascinating. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, 
it, it is. It's, it is. It's completely. It, you, you you couldn't. It's just fascinating because I watch your shows all the time, um, and you inspire me about the UK. You know, what I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with Northwest Scotland. You know, I want to right. go up there, and it's, it's just beautiful, just beautiful. Uh-huh. You know, people don't. You know, thanks to your shows. Um, oh, you know, and it, it, you. but it's like I, I spoke to Simon Reeve recently, um, uh-huh. and, he, and he obviously goes around the world and does other things. And and he was big on saying it's not about going to around the world or getting on a plane. We should explore our own country. And he was big. I don't know if you know Simon, but obviously you must have met I, I him. Don't. Okay. I, I, I don't. I know. I know who he is, and I'm connected to people that have worked with him, but yeah. I don't know him personally. Fascinating, um, fascinating guy. And um, but he was saying how much the UK has got to offer. Forget about getting on a plane. He's like, fuck, uh-huh. fuck getting on a plane, t- see what you've got in the UK, because he's big on, he's got so many places to see, and obviously that's why I'm, I'm speaking to you, because obviously you're the guy that does most of the UK, well, if not all the UK, Yeah. and he's a good... Well, it is, and it is, for me, I, it's easy to overlook, I mean, I often make the analogy that Britain is like someone you see every day, mm. it's like, it's like your mum, yeah. you know, or, or whoever, or mm. it's like, or it's like your neighbour next door, mm. and because you, because they're just there, mm. You just take them completely for granted. Totally. But if you were to sit down with your next door neighbour, like you know, old Mrs. McGinty or whatever, yeah, yeah, she yeah. would have something fascinating to tell you, guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. But in Britain, Britain's like that, you know. So that you don't like just hearing from Simon Reeve. There are so many places within Britain that you just you're not scratching, you're not even yes. scratching the surface of it. Totally. And you don't even have to go a hundred miles within Britain. Mm. The chances are there's a building in your town. That you've never looked at twice, yeah. And that you've walked past a hundred times, and you, you just don't know what it is. Yeah. So yeah. you're absolutely right, and that is the point. And the and the point is that to me, it it, it's, it makes sense to go to these places. I mean, they're all yeah. within reach. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot yeah. of these places you just have to jump on the bus totally. or get in a car. Yeah. And you can go to places where something that changed the world happened. You know, there's a, one of the places in the book is the is the William Wilberforce House in Hull. Okay. I mean, he was the man that campaigned for and, and, and secured the end of the, of the, of the slave, trade. slave trade. Yeah, yeah. And you can go and you can go and walk through the halls of his house. Jeez. You know, and you can walk in the garden where you know he was MT for that part of Hull and yeah, and yeah. whatever. And you know what he what he conceived of there and the speeches that he subsequently made in Parliament changed the world. Mm-hmm. And you can go and walk the same floorboards that he walked on. And, and then where you know where you are in, in Wales, I mean, I'd be in Clin Valor, you know, the reservoir now where they, where they found the, the Iron Age and Bronze Age yeah. hoard yeah. in the 1920s. Um, I, uh, um, uh, um, Great Orm, the copper mine. Now, the, for a long time, the, war, the Bronze Age. Everyone's heard about the Bronze Age. Mm. And for a long time, the the, uh, the the supply of copper coming out of Great Orm was the richest in the old world. Jeez, yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to make a bronze sword, mm. you needed to get together uh, copper and tin. Okay. And the biggest sources of both were in Britain. Yeah, in Wales, yeah. Uh, the Great Orm in Wales and Cornish tin. Mm. So people would have been coming to Britain thousands of years ago. They would have known about that part of North yeah. Wales. They would yeah. have known about the southwest of England because if they didn't, they couldn't make the things mm. that they needed to get through their daily lives. Mm. And you can go, and you can go to the Great Orm. You can go and walk through the the mm. the, the uh, shafts and and whatever left behind by the miners mm. thousands of years ago. Uh, you can go to you know you can go to tin mines in Cornwall, mm. and these are these are places that remind you that Britain was significant not just when it had an empire. Mm. You know, people think you know the time of the British Empire was the, you know was the greatest time for maybe in the history of Britain. Mm. Maybe it was. But it's worth remembering that people would have known about and would have depended on connections to Britain thousands of years ago. So they were, it's, it's like you say, we've you, been around for much, much longer than people tend to believe. You know, I'm not going to go down like say about. You just don't think about. You just don't no. think about it. Why would you? I mean, that's just my. That's my. That's what I think about every day. I mean, I write books and present television series about mm. about history, so I, mean, I do have time to think about these things, but. Hopefully, a book like this one is just enough to, you know, remind people that and, and raise awareness as well, and, and raise yeah. awareness to what we've got. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and I, I mean, I mean, do you have any arguments? I mean, probably going off off, off tacky. Do you have any arguments with like the, the, the religious types who say that history is flawed, or you know, it's always set in, you know, the creationists and all that nonsense? Do you do? You, what do you have any? Well, I 
well. I mean, there's, I mean, I mean, the 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 book is actually there's quite a lot in the book about the, the various people like Mary Annie mm. down in um, uh, down in the side of England okay. when Regis she was the fossil hunter. Yeah, I mean, she was part of that that process that, that, that unfolded through the 17 and 1800s where people realised scientifically. Mm. Why the world wasn't six thousand years old? Yeah, yeah. As, as it apparently been described in the Old Testament, <laughs> um, but they were. And at the same time, for what it was worth, it, it didn't necessarily mean that they stopped being uh, religious people. Mm. It just meant that they recalibrated the time scale over which events must have uh, unfolded. Course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and so there, there are various. You know, in Salisbury Crags in Edinburgh. Um, you know, it was with uh, the, 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 the geologist James Hutton. He was amongst the very first people to realise that the world had to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old, yeah, yeah. based on the geological processes that he was seeing mm. uh, in the rocks mm. just around his home city. Mm. So uh, th th that story of, uh, of advancing human understanding of the great age of the planet, mm. a lot of that happened in Britain. You know, those, those great steps were taken by scientists and geologists and others working at Britain. So the world's understanding of the world mm. in, in great part happened here during times yeah. like the Scottish Enlightenment, yeah. you know, where these great leaps of thought were being made. It, it's, if you think about this, like everything stems from the UK or the Great Britain. You know, all the history, well, if you think about it. Well, we're a huge, we have, for a tiny, for a, for a set of tiny islands off the northwest of Europe, we have undoubtedly had a disproportionate impact on the, the, on the, the shaping of the world that we live in today. Yeah. It's, I guess we're just fortunate that it, it stemmed from our shores. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. yeah. Well, fortunate or not, it's just fascinating. You yeah. have to ask yourself, yeah. why? Why did the population that, that colonised these islands why did they eventually, why did they have such an impact? I was going to ask you the same English, question. How do you, English, why English do you? is effectively the language of the world. It's yeah. the language of the internet. Now why? Because it's a language spoken to begin with by just a few thousand people living off the northwest coast of Europe. It, why did that language take over the world? It's a conundrum, I, isn't it? You know, it's like, why? Uh -huh. Why? You know, why? why? Yeah. Well, why? part of it, part of it, part of it is hopefully answered in the book. It's, it's mm. because people have been here, thinking here, overcoming obstacles here, mm. developing great thoughts here mm. for a hell of a long time. Mm. You know, there's been a lot of clever people, generation after generation, and, uh, you know, and, and those great thoughts have in their time gone right around the world. Mm. I mean, if I can just go and ask you about yourself, I mean, was it a natural yeah. progression? Because obviously you were born in Scotland, and if, would, you mm -hmm. th would you think that if you were born, say, I don't know, in London or Manchester, you would have, you would have had the the path that you went on. Do, do you know what I mean? I think I think I, I do credit my mum and dad with, with a lot of it, basically, but, mm. but purely because of the things that they were interested in. So, mm. I mean, wherever we had been in a family, yeah. my mum and dad were both great readers, for example. Yeah. So we always we always had lots of books in the house. Yeah. Uh, novels as well as non-fiction. Okay. I was always able to read a lot. My mum and dad were, were just ordinary working class stock. Okay. But uh, it, because they were both, because they had both read a great deal, you know, they were they were pretty well informed. Yeah. Uh, so I was always able to say to my mum and dad, you know, why did this happen and what was such and such and how come and, and they were good sources of information and yeah. and they were also, um, you know, very in, they encouraged me at school to mm. to concentrate on the things that I thought I was good at. Yeah. So a lot of my friends were pushed into things like maths and physics and mm. came to all sorts of grief when it came to their exams. Yeah. But my mum, my mum and dad had said to me, well, what subjects do you think you're good at? And I said, well, history and English. And yeah. they said, well, do them. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so I concentrated on the things that I enjoyed and that I felt that I was probably going to be able to get good enough marks in in my exams. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I grew up mostly in the southwest of Scotland. Mm. But, you know, my, my parents were very encouraging. And then when I, when I said that I was going to go to university and study archaeology, now... Mm. It's a fairly fringy subject, really, there's, and there's not an obvious career path in it. No, no, no. And looking back on it, I suppose a lot of parents might have said, Why? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Do yeah. something that will get you a job. Yeah. You know, study something else. Did your parents not but say that? Mom, no, they didn't. No, my mum and dad, when, I, when they said, you know, when I, they said, what are you going to study then? And I said, archaeology, and my mum and dad said, great, that sounds fantastic. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Away I went, I studied archaeology, and that, that's made all the difference, because... Yeah. Uh, 
you know, they were always very, they were always very open-minded and very encouraging mm. uh, about me following the path that I wanted to follow. And luck has had a lot to do with it, but, yeah. but nonetheless, you know, you know, things, I, you know, I have been able to make a career out of, out of the things I was interested in. Mm. So, so in essence, then it's it's down to your parents motivating you and helping and encouraging you. Yeah, to I, where I, you are. Than, I think more than anything else, they were just they were always just interested to see and my sisters. Mm. I mean, they were interested to see what I would, what I was interested in. They didn't okay. push me in one direction or the other. Mm. They just when I said I really enjoy history, and then I think I'm going to study archaeology. Mm. My mum and dad always just said, "Great, just just keep us up to date." Let's then. Do it. Did you, just, did you just do it then without the end goal of saying, I'm going to do this job, I want to do that job? You just I wanted just to fell do... in love. No, I just fell in love with the idea. Because yeah. I had enjoyed history at school, yeah. when I became aware of what archaeology was, mm. it struck me that um, you know history only takes you back so far. History is predicated upon the written word. You, know, you see, yeah. you have to wait until people can write books before totally. you've got history. Totally. So we've only got, that only covers about 5,000 years. Yeah, yeah. And realistically, much less than that. So... It struck me that archaeology was a way of um, finding out why people were doing what they were doing hundreds of thousands of years ago. It was like the opportunity to start the book much mm. nearer page one. You know, the story of the, the story of humankind. Yeah. You know the early chapters of it are written by geology and archaeology and paleontology. You know history yeah. starts informing it yeah. much later on. Uh, and I, when I realised what archaeology was, and the fact that it was a, a, a kind of a, an outdoors thing, it wasn't confined to the classroom. You <laughs> yeah, know, it was out yeah. on excavations. Yeah. Uh, it, I just fell in love with it, and the fact that, it, well, as it turned out, I mean, I, I only worked as a freelance archaeologist for a few years, and then I realised its limitations at that point, and I retrained as a journalist. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. But, yeah, yeah. But I still never, I absolutely, I never at any point did I regret having studied archaeology. You know, even when I was working as, in newspapers, mm. I still uh, was thankful for the for the archaeological background that I'd had because I yeah. felt that it, 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 it gave me a slightly different angle on things. Mm. And then, you know, in the fullness of time, when I stumbled into television, uh, it was archaeology that was the that was the subject matter of that television, and so mm. it, it was as though it just all worked out in the end. Okay. I mean, well, I guess your message is then to anybody is. Do what you want to do. Do what you love. Education. Yeah, wise. Well, yes, that's what we say to our kids. I mean, my kids are 15, 12, and 10, mm. and we. Um, I try to be like my mum and dad were with me. I, I just say, you know, what is it that you enjoy? Mm. Of the subjects that you're doing at school, what do you enjoy? Yeah. And yeah. at the moment, my little girl is very interested in languages, and she's very interested in art and design. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, my, my wee boy is very interested in art and design as well. He's also he's he's actually quite academic. He's quite good at maths and okay. quite good at other things. And I'm just, um, you know, absolutely. I think it's go with, you know, go where your heart lies. Mm. It's that old. It's that old adage about you know if you if you do something you love, then you never actually have to go to work. Totally, yeah. You know, the, That's why I do this. <laughs> if, the thing that, if, the, if the thing that you're earning a living from yeah. makes you happy, yeah, then yeah. it's not work. It's not. No, no, you're right. And that's what well, everybody should aspire to be, but I know it's, it's not. Most people can't do it because of circumstances. It's not, it's, it doesn't work for no. you know. You've got to pay the bills and things, and yeah. that's why I, I had to get out of archaeology and reach. Which at the time I didn't particularly want to be a journalist. It's just that an opportunity presented itself at that time, and I thought, well, I can probably do that. You know, it's yeah. asking questions, it's writing. I can do that. You know. Yeah. I well, felt it was. I felt it was something that I could make a living at, and then it, as it turned out, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Was it more, more of a needs must? Was it more of a needs must decision when you had to go into journalism, or kind of? It was a sort of fifty-fifty. Okay. And I figured I could probably get to enjoy it because it was primarily about writing, and I always enjoyed writing. Okay. I like that was you know as an archaeologist and and it, uh, as a little boy, I mean, I was always one for writing. I was always writing stories. Yeah. Yeah. And poetry, and you know, and. Whatever, I was always writing, so I knew going into journalism, well, it wasn't necessarily current affairs that, were my, that was my favourite subject. Mm. I, mm. I enjoyed the writing aspect of it. So, um, And then once I got into it and started uh, learning more about it, and I did fall for it, and I did become enthusiastic about it. But mm. How do you, uh, um, I know you've not been a journalist, I mean, how do you connect with a lot of the fans then? I mean, obviously you've been 
obviously, if I say, well, you do what you've done, what I've done, you're right, you know, you've, write, you've written stuff for, for newspapers. Um, but yeah. now you're obviously on the TV. How do you cope with all the, I don't know, the, the fans, you know, the stardom, you know? Well, I mean, it's not, it's not, like, it's not like being Justin Bieber or anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> <quite a> <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm, I mean, 99% of the time I have very nice contacts with people. People yeah. come up to me most days. Mm. If I'm out in the street, here or here at home in Stirling or, or elsewhere in the country, yeah. normally every day someone will, will recognise me and come up to say hello. And literally 99 times out of 100, it's more, it's 999 times out of 1,000. It's a mm. friendly encounter. Yeah. I saw um, something the other day actually saying that you were in a cinema in Stirling or something watching a film, Incredibles 2, on, on, on Twitter. Uh, and I thought it was true on that. Right. <laughs> that's said, right. Yeah, you know, that's so, right. Yeah, yeah. People spot me all the time. You've got to be very careful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, it, it's always, I mean, I've, I've courted controversy unintentionally. I mean, people over the years have asked me my opinion about things like Scottish independence yeah. and, and Brexit and whatever. You know, I've been invited to, to hear my opinion about things and, yeah. you know, inevitably, you know, some people don't, don't like, like my opinions and, and some people do, so I, I yeah. get a little bit of flack. But, yeah, yeah. you know, in terms of when you say what's it like, you know, contact with, with fans, mm. it's always been nice. I, yeah. I've never, I mean, I've had, I've had, you know, some, some, you know, some less than enthusiastic messages on social media sometimes, but in terms of face to face, no one, no one has ever come up to me face to face in the street, really, and said anything but hello. Good, good. Because I know, like, obviously, you know, I don't when, get... yeah, the independence thing was obviously something that was put in the papers, wasn't it, about it being a dead dog or something? Yeah, yeah, you but know. a lot of things were being said and people were being quoted. Nobody ever said it to me directly. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you know it's out there, but then that's just, a, I mean, if you're, in the, if you're in the public eye at all, I mean, you publish stuff every week, there'll be people yeah. that don't like what you write. No, it's true, it's true, yeah. Um, and whether you know it or not, there'll be people that have read something you've written and thought, Less of you. <laughs> it's just, it's inevitable. Yes. You know, as well as there have been people that, that agree with you 100% and think, well, yeah. to your elbow. Yeah. As soon as you put your head above the parapet and say something. Yeah, well, it's true. Somebody's going to disagree with you. It's true. I did something of the week and I got negative and, and positive. Some people I even know got, got pissed off with it. And you just think, yeah, well, it's just I the mean, truth. But, that, but, most, but, but most people, you've got to console yourself with the fact that it's a small act of bravery to mm. actually be be honest and public about what you think. Yeah, yeah. You, you can just live a quiet life and keep your mouth shut, which is fair enough, and a lot of people do that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you do actually, when the occasion presents itself, stand up and say what you actually believe, yeah. that's a small act of courage. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, no, it's not to be discouraged, I don't think. And if you, someone's inevitably going to say, well, I think you're wrong. Yeah, it's, it's always the well, same, isn't it? Fair enough. Yeah, it's like you write, if you have any book you read or any film you've watched or TV show, people like it or people don't like it, people are indifferent. Uh, you know, yeah, everything. that's the danger. You know, you put a book out there or you put an article out there or you put an opinion column out there, mm. well, you know, you, no one's forcing you to do it. And if you do do it, mm. then you've just got to sort of stand up straight and face the fact that somebody's going to think that you're, you know, yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I'll ask you one last question because I know your time's precious. Um, That's all right. Any, have you got had, had any regrets over over the years of any place you've been to, and you know, just thinking why did I go there? You know, for the sh- for the safer coast. No, sure. no, okay. No, I don't. No, okay. not at all. Okay. No, I don't think. I don't think any. Um, I think everywhere is worth seeing. I mean, I've, some yeah. of the places I've seen have been have been prettier than others. Yeah, okay. And that's a, that's a fact. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but every everywhere is interesting. You know, be it the most industrialised or or be it the whatever. Um, every location is has a merit of some kind in it, or it's got something. It's got something to teach us. Yeah. Uh, and I've done. I've had. I mean, I've been in. I've sailed a fifty foot yacht to Antarctica Jeez. from the Falkland Islands. Oh I've, wow. Wow. I've been in I've been in Japan, I've been in China, I've been all over North America, yeah, um, I've yeah. been all over Europe, yeah. I've been in all over Africa. Yeah. I've seen ridiculously privileged opportunities to see all sorts of things, and some places that I've been in Africa and elsewhere are, are not. You know, you see some things that you think, oh God, that's terrible, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't regret any of them because they've all taught me something. Yeah, you always take you always take everything. You know, when you see somewhere, you always take something away from it. At, at the very, at the very least, at the very least, it always makes you appreciate home a little bit more. Yeah, is that why you 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 you? you I mean, you still live in Scotland, don't you? Yeah, we live in Stirling. I, I love it here. We've been here about eleven years now. Uh, my kids, I mean, it's really the only home they've ever known. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, I, and I genuinely believe that this part of Scotland is, you know, is one of the most beautiful places that I've ever seen. It, it, I still think that, and yeah. the more places I see, uh, it intensifies that feeling. I mean, I see other places that I think are fantastic. Yeah. I, 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 all of them add a little bit of appreciation to to my home. Yeah, it's like once you find your your home, your place, you're happy. It's like me where I live. I think it's beautiful by the coast, and you know. Well, it's, it's you, where you are, I mean, that, that part of South Wales is beautiful. Yeah, I doubt. Yeah, no, it is. It's a fantastic place. Um, and also, with, with another question then about where you've been, I mean, do you still get, I don't know, thrilled when you've gone to a place where you've always wanted to go? Um, yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, yeah, still, of course. every time, you know, you still get that buzz, you know. You think. Yeah, uh, uh, countless times. I try and remember. It's one of those things I try and remember. You know, we'll be, I'll be, just recently there, I spent a month in China. Yeah. You know, and we were in a, one of the provinces we were in was called Yunnan, okay. which is over in the, uh, it's sort of over towards the west of China. It's in the. It's as you're get, getting towards Tibet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. It, I know it. I know it. Yeah. And it's so you're up in the mountains. You know, we were up. I mean, where we were in places like Dali. Yeah. Uh, we were at, we're about eight thousand feet up. So yeah. you're, you're you're high up. Mm. You're 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 in that part of the world where it's all starting to get quite mountainous, and you know you try and say to yourself, this is me at my work. Yeah. I do this for a living. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'd be in this, I'd be looking out over some f- spectacular vista, looking out over forest, mm. you know, up in a mountain in Yunnan, and you think, I'm really here. Mm. I'm, and I'm here because I'm being paid to be here. Yeah. You know, this is my job. Uh, and I try and I, I often turn to the, you know, the cameraman or, the, or whoever I'm with and say, you know, this is our work. <laughs> we do we do this for a living. Yeah. yeah so I, yeah. I, I try to be mindful of uh, of the privilege of, of seeing these places. You, you create so much. So I always feel I do genuinely feel I would never have got. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Australia and New Zealand, and I was able to take my family with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a family, we spent months in Australia and in New Zealand, and you know, I thank the universe for the fact that we were able to do that for the kids and that my yeah. wife was able to see these places as well and we yeah. do try and remind ourselves that most people will never get to do this yeah I yeah, mean you, you obviously are one of the most envied p- people in the world by people watching the show <laughs> and when you you know it's like that bastard that guy's no, been there no, about, I, do you know. try, <laughs> I do try to I do try to acknowledge it and to not yeah. take it for granted yeah, yeah, yeah. you know something the, t- the travelling can be very exhausting yeah of course you know you can look up, when you're filming you tend to be on the move the whole time you don't you don't spend very long anywhere, so you're constantly on the move, and that can be very draining. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and under those circumstances, you can start to get, you know, you, you start to drift into a zone where you're not paying proper attention to okay. what you're seeing. Yeah. And yeah. I try and I try and be aware of that starting to happen, and to give us a shake and to think, no, this might be the only chance you get to see this. Pay attention. So basically, every time you you're in a place, every day you you make it as if if it's your first day of filming. You know, you're on alert. Yeah. Yeah. You try it. You try and stay yeah. aware. Stay alert. Thank you. Thank you for the um, a, an amazing chat, actually. Um, oh, good. No, it's been good talking to you. I enjoyed it. You've just, you've just, you beat the record by three minutes of talking to Sam and Reeve. I could have spoke to him and, and yourself for longer, but I'm just aware I've got to write all this up, so I'm thinking, shit. Good man. <laughs> It'll be a good long man. piece. Good so, but you're not on social media, are you? You're not on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Oh, you? Oh, I'm, right. guy on t- I'm sort of, I'm sort of hidden. I, I fly in there, sort of below the radar, just ah. so I can keep an eye on what's going on. Okay, okay. So I was going to say, if I put the piece up, I was getting connected, but I couldn't find you, so I don't know if you. I'll maybe ask um, Debbie uh, where you are, and I put you in the link when I when I put the piece up, if you know what I mean. Good man. Be in the All right. So hopefully I'll come to see you in Cardiff when, when you're down here, anyway. So. Excellent. We'll come and say hello after. OK, dude, yeah, OK, cool, cool. Well, it's been lovely okay. speaking to you, mate. I, I appreciate it. And keep up, keep up what you're doing, you know. Uh, most, the most envious guy in the UK, in the, not, not the world. You and Simon, you know, I wish I was you, I wish I was Simon. So I've, I've been in the right. army, so but I've done my tra- travels, but not like what you do. So. Oh, gosh, right, OK. But no, um, keep up the good work, mate. I appreciate it, what you do, so. And, and the book as well, so I'm going to start reading the book. So, yeah. Splendid. Nice one. Thank you, Good mate. stuff. Okay. Good talking to you. Okay. Right. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.